as you may or may not be aware, solar energy technology is really playing a dynamic role in today's clean energy economy. And by dynamic, you know, today we may focus on solar panels, but uh, Bert just told us about a story of a solar powered floating classroom and all different types of projects. This is really, it's here, it's now, it's the future. And today we're very lucky to be joined with, uh, in our Q&A with Andrew Wade, president of My Generation Energy. Uh, they're a solar energy company based in Hyannis, right on Independence Drive. Andrew's prepared a nice little presentation for us uh, about the current landscape of the solar industry, some of the benefits of both commercial and residential solar, keeping or how to keep lo uh, solar local, as well as battery storage solutions. Andrew is a native Cape Codder, growing up in East Ham and graduating from Nauset Regional High School. He attended Clemson University in South Carolina, where he received a bachelor's degree in business marketing. In 09, returned to Cape Cod and joined the team at MyEnergy, becoming president and CEO in 2014. Under Andrew's leadership, My Generation Energy has grown into a, a regional leader in the solar industry. This is an interactive session. Please drop a chat in the, uh, please drop a message in the chat box at any time. If you have a question about the presentation or we can wait till the end, I'll kind of, if we get too far, I'll just kind of stick my hand up and wave for Andrew um, if we get too far along. But with that said, Andrew, if you want to share your slides, we can get rocking here. Great. We'll do that. Um, thank you, Dale. Let's see, share. So as Dale mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Wade. Uh, my company is My Generation Energy. We are a local solar energy company. Uh, we've installed um, over a thousand systems here on uh, Cape Cod in the islands um, into Southeast Massachusetts, but based here in the Cape and most of our business and experiences here on Cape Cod. Um, <clears throat> I will say, I am trying to keep this presentation informative versus uh, marketing. Uh, you'll see our logo, but um, it's not. This is not, uh, you know, my generation energy specific uh, presentation. It's it's to uh, to talk about the technology and you know sort of what the current landscape of solar is. Um, and I would certainly encourage any questions as I go along. Uh, this is the first presentation I've done in a while. Um, I'm excited to be here and, uh, 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 but I, you know, usually I'm doing these in person and so uh, getting feedback as I go, I, I greatly appreciate and uh, certainly would like to keep the conversation open. So uh, quick agenda on what I'm going to go over today, uh, we're going to start just on how solar works, uh, the, the technology behind traditional solar, um, why it works here in, on Cape Cod. Then we'll get into residential uh, solar. Uh, we'll talk about the financials, the incentives that are currently available for solar. Uh, we're going to most of what we're, we're focusing on is um, is going to be residential, small commercial stuff. We'll talk about commercial solar. Um, the, the different options there. There are really too many to go over um, in this presentation. So if you're interested in site-specific commercial solar, that's something that we could talk about after the presentation. But um, uh, so we'll, we'll dive a little bit into commercial solar and then we'll touch on battery storage should we have time towards the end. Um, so quickly, we... <clears throat> I get this question a lot and have over the last 13 years. Um, does solar make sense on Cape Cod? Um, as Dale mentioned, I went to college in, in South Carolina. And so I have a lot of friends that uh, I still talk to and, and they're in different parts of the country. And they're asking this question to me like, here up, up in Massachusetts, uh, you know, selling solar. Does that does it even work up there? Um, Cape Cod is the capital um, for solar in the Northeast. And this map, um, there are several like this. This one is uh, my favorite, just has the bright colors, makes it easy to understand. This is a, a map, um, a study done by the University of Central Florida. They took the 
uh, uh, say a two kilowatt, which is about five solar panels with uh, the technology we have today. So five, a five panel system anywhere across the United States and how much solar that would generate uh, on average throughout the year on a daily basis. So you'll see the kilowatt hours per day are the, the color coding. You obviously have your hot spot out in the desert, um, but here in Massachusetts, you'll see that you know we are getting into that yellow that's similar to central Texas, central Florida. Um, the reason that is, is because of the temperature coefficient. Uh, panels are more efficient when they're cooler. So you have uh, the nice cooler summer days when it's 80 degrees here, it's 110 in, in Florida. We're actually generating more electricity because of that, the temperature coefficient. There are panels, uh, there are new technologies that um, are trying to improve that temperature coefficient so that um, so that panels are more effective in hotter climates, hotter environments, but generally, um, even then, panels are, are more effective when they're cooler. So we're getting into the, the best time of year for solar, the springtime, the next few months are our peak production months because we have the long days, um, we have cool weather, it's uh, the, the few times that we actually see the systems completely max out uh, throughout the year. Um, so it's an exciting time of year for us, certainly. Uh, this is where I apologize to the engineers in the room. <laughs> um, but this is a, a cartoon that's going to show, sort of show uh, the, the cross section. If we cut a panel in half and looked at it from the side, uh, the not to scale, certainly, but you have your glass on top that's tempered glass to protect the solar panel, the little gray dots underneath that, um, your conductor lines. That is uh, another, there are new uh, panels as technology improves that have back conductors, um, but for this purpose, we're gonna have a, a, the conductors on the front of the panel and the, and the conductor in the back. So, um, just call this the fancy silicon stuff. Uh, the green line in the middle is the PN junction. So you have your positively charged and negatively charged sides of, of your silicon. Uh, the negative, the circles with the negative symbol in the middle obviously represent our electrons. Uh, so if we take a cross section of that and look at where the electrons are, they're sitting in a trough or a hole. Um, so they're in their happy place without any uh, radiation. As photons come down, it pops those electrons up out of that hole, out of their happy place, other, to the other side of the, the silicon, and then follows the path of least resistance back to where they want to live in that hole. So this is happening billions of times per second, and it's creating direct current, uh, which therefore creates electricity. So we're talking about the, the temperature coefficient. You kind of assume that that trough where that electron is sitting, uh, that grows as um, the cooler it is, and so it creates more current. Um, so we hop over to um, how it makes our house run. Obviously, everything in our homes or in our businesses running off of, of AC, alternating current. So you have your solar panel, the photons raining down, you have an inverter, and then you have your um, uh, appliances within your home. There it is. So you have your direct current coming out into the inverter, inverter converting to alternating current, and your refrigerator happy dancing in your kitchen. Um, the project design components, here's your house as it is now. You have a, a router for your internet, you have your service panel um, and your utility meter coming in. Panels go on the roof. Here we're showing microinverters behind each panel. So what you have coming off of the roof is alternating current. So household AC coming directly off the roof. Each panel has its own inverter down to an AC disconnect switch and a solar production meter. 
The solar production meter measures everything that's coming from your system, all the production of, of the solar. That's important when we get to the incentives, uh, one of the incentives, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. The, uh, that feeds directly into your electric panel, which feeds your appliances in your home. Uh, at the same time, your utility meter now is swapped to a net meter. Net meter allows the power to flow both ways back to the utility and in, in from the utility. And we'll talk about that on the next slide as well. Uh, all systems uh, should have, um, all systems that we install have monitoring units that connect to your router, then send out a signal so that you can see what your system's doing real time uh, from anywhere, real time, uh, pr daily production, real time production, monthly, annual production, lifetime. Now, as I mentioned, that solar production meter is uh, creating your renewable energy certificates. There was an older program um, back when we last spoke with um, the Cape Cod Technology Council, there was the, the SREC program, which was solar renewable energy certificates. Uh, it was the same sort of trading of renewable energy certificates that was solar specific. Uh, this is a new program the state has developed called the SMART program. Um, solar Massachusetts Renewable Target is where the SMART comes from. Uh, it works a little bit differently than the SREC program. Uh, but ultimately you're still selling your renewable energy certificates. The utility uh, with the SMART program, the utility reads your, your net meter and they either charge you for or give you a credit uh, for electricity you've used or overproduced. They also read your solar production meter and will send you a check or direct deposit uh, funds into account of your choice for the rights to your renewable energy certificates that that solar production meter has tracked. And that's on a monthly basis. Um, for residential systems, it's a 10 year term. Uh, for commercial systems or systems over 25 kilowatts, I should say, are uh, as a 20, 20 year term. Um, it's a declining block program. So the value of the SMART program decreases as more uh, participants apply for uh, the incentive. Uh, but that's generally how it works. So net metering, again, here's your house pre-solar or your business pre-solar, just the utility meter spinning away so you can run everything in your house. Put panels on the roof. There's your solar meter. Some's coming from the, the solar production into your house. In this case, you're still using a little bit from Eversource, a little bit of a sunnier day, which doesn't really happen. It's not static like this, but there are times where you will pr be producing enough from your solar to meet exactly what the building needs. And then in most cases, like we're, we're into, um, a day like today, at least here in, in Chatham, and as Bert said in Brewster, um, the, there'll be overproduction in most situations where you're using everything, that, uh, using the solar in your house to run your house. It's creating more than you can use. And so it goes back to the utility as net metering credits. Net metering credits can be used at any time so that you can take them back tonight when the sun goes down, you're not producing power. Uh, they'll sit on your bill till until the winter if you don't use them throughout the summer. In my situation, I, I build up net metering credits through the spring and through the summer, and then I use them up um, as I get into the winter. I actually have more credits than I need. And so I can send those to another account. And so the, you know, the benefits of net metering, use electricity whenever you need it. Uh, so you're produce, overproducing, goes back to the utility. You take that back whenever you need that power. You make electricity whenever you can. If you were off grid and you had a battery backup only and the battery was full without net metering, 
you would not have anywhere to send that additional power. So the utility almost works as a storage facility um, when it comes to net metering. You're pretty much selling your electricity. It goes back through your net meter. It goes to your neighbor's house. They buy it from the utility, assuming they don't have solar. They buy it from the utility at, at their 25, 27, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, whatever, whatever it is today. Um, the utility gives you credit for that and they send the credit back to you when you need it. And then transfer excess power. As I mentioned, my house overproduces uh, for my needs. So I did send some to my parents in East Ham. When they got solar, um, I, I changed the transfer of the credits to a friend who lives in Dennis. So that, uh, the, the benefits of net metering, there, um, there are net metering caps within Massachusetts in Eversource territory. We're lucky enough that we have not um, hit those net metering caps yet. Uh, exempt facilities are systems, the residential systems that are 10 kilowatts single phase. Um, so 10 kilowatts for most residential systems are exempt. They get full net metering credit. Uh, 25 kilowatts three phase, you get full net metering credit. When you start going above that, the utility does decrease the full net metering value, 60% um, of retail. So that's something to, to keep in mind as you're designing a system uh, that's participating in net metering. Let's see, so uh, potential of solar for a site. How can you determine if, um, if your site is good uh, this is, there's a few, there's the uh, LiDAR technology, which we use. Uh, so that's a remote way of, of determining shading. Uh, but the three main factors are pitch, orientation, and shading. Uh, I think a site visit is always the best, even if you're using LiDAR to make sure that the trees are where they, uh, where they were whenever the LiDAR data was recorded. Uh, this particular house in Brewster, we looked at using a solar pathfinder. So we were actually on the roof of this house. Um, but the black numbers are the overall effectiveness of that location based on the pitch orientation and shading. Uh, so the 100% the would be if you were a uh, 41 degree roof facing due south uh, with absolutely no shading. So this system is 80% is of ideal uh, as is, uh, sorry, the top middle section of the roof is at 80%. Um, the bottom left-hand corner, 59% of, of ideal. That's without training, without removing trees. The red or orange numbers, um, we, you can take trees out of these shading analysis programs to be able to give you an idea of if you were to take out some trees, what that effectiveness would be. So we, this is what we looked at uh, before and after tree removal or before and assuming tree removal. Uh, and those are the numbers we came up with. This is the system that was installed there. And you can see it looks like that the customer did plan on removing that, uh, the one tree in the foreground of the photo with as a, a yellow band around it. Um, or this is the production. Uh, believe this is just a few months of production, uh, but you'll see the top right corner is the highest, uh, the best location, as we saw in in the the site assessment, and the worst is the lower left hand corner. This is um, with microinverters with DC optimizers. You do have panel by panel monitoring. You can see exactly what every panel is produced. You can choose. Uh, you know, a, a single day, a week, whatever uh, length of time you'd like to look to see what panels are producing. But you could then determine if there's a tree that's shading a few panels that you'd like to take down. Uh, but shading analysis are very accurate uh, to give you a, a good estimate of, of what um, you can assume the system will produce. Uh, any questions on the components, the shading, uh, before I get into residential. No questions. On the, uh, there, there is a question related to the durability of the panels. Um, 
don't know if you want to address that now. It's a specific situation. The other question is, uh, do you, is there a way of knowing how wires or inefficiency in the panels, do they know, do they now have wires slash inefficiency in the panels to support melting of the snow? Sorry, I said I said I was having a bad day. But that was Rich's question. <laughs> that was wires uh, inefficiency in the panels to support. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, the the they don't. There's nothing in the panel that supports the melting of snow. Um, there are systems that we've seen that attach a uh, it's a it's like a heating conduit that that attaches to the racking of the system to improve the melting. Um, I, I it, you're using more electricity to melt snow during a, a time of the year when production is the lowest. Um, so we typically just say, let the snow melt. If you have a ground mount system uh, and you want to go out and, and brush off the snow, that's one thing. If you're looking to get on a roof when there's snow already on it, uh, I would say um, <laughs> spare yourself the, the danger of falling off a roof. Um, but in most cases, the snow does melt off. Uh, you'll see most of the, the panels that we're installing I think all on residential have black frames. A lot have a black back sheet. As soon as the sun comes out, um, in because it's temp because it's tempered glass, we do see the snow melting off of panels um, quicker than they would an asphalt roof. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, two more questions. I think are relevant to at this point, if that's okay. Yep. Um, George has a question here. Um, so he lives near a saltwater pond. During the summer, seagulls grab clams and ponds out of the water and drop them on his roof, presumably to break them open and have a snack. Um, do you know how? Do you know if the panels can withstand something like that, or have a comment about that? Yeah. Uh, the, so the warranty is, is three quarter inch hail, which we certainly don't get um, yet. Changes in in climate, who knows? Um, but that that's the the warranty. Uh, they are very durable. Uh, we have um, a few systems, and think of one that is uh, at the Suet Harbor, where we you know, we've been up on the roof, and there certainly are pa are panels that have had um, shells. Uh, there's shells all over the roof, so they I'm sure they've been dropped on the panels, and that hasn't caused an issue yet. Uh, but that it's certainly something to think about. Um, on the residential side, we haven't seen any panels break due to uh, uh, seagulls dropping shells. It's a it's a good question. Uh, they yeah they are quite quite durable. Um, okay, next question uh, from Rich: Is there a minimum roof area? Uh, this is probably a question of break even, I guess. Um, is there a minimum roof area needed to make this work for a house? Uh, not particularly. A, a panel is about 20 square feet. Um, you know, we go by inches, 67 inches by 40 inches is the, the dimensions of a typical panel, something in that range. Um, this On the smaller end, uh, we're actually wiring a system that was six panels uh, that today we're wiring the system. So, that's on the probably the small end. Our average system is around eighteen to twenty-five panels. Um, so it it, it depends. Um, if you have high usage in a very small roof, it really means that you're going to use all the electricity the system produces. Uh, so you're not going to see a huge difference on your electric bill necessarily, but you're definitely going to be able to take advantage of all the kilowatt hours the system produces. Um, so. So it, it might be site specific. If it's if there's absolutely no room, uh, if we can only fit a few panels, you're going to be paying a lot uh, for those fixed costs of application fees, um, you know, to the utility, to the town, uh, building permits, everything else. So uh, there, I would say anything under six panels is you're, you're paying a lot for for the uh, the fixed costs. But there's still a return. Um, you know, you could still see a, a pretty decent return on investment, um, even with a very small system. Great. Uh, technical question from Eldon. I had, the, I actually had the same question. 
Uh, curious about the efficiency of the inverters. Um, is there a gain if you're if you're not inverting? And obviously in a house, it's you have to convert it, right? But I don't know if this question is regards to maybe a boat or something different. But how much gain could there be using a DC device off of? Yeah, so that's a good question. There's there's um so that the system that we showed was uh, a micro inverter system converting AC on the roof. Um, Right, every system that we've ever installed and that we probably ever will install will be uh, at some point needs to be converted to to AC. Um, so I'm not sure. Okay. You, you know, uh, the, I guess the question is, so I guess this is a two part question. How efficient are the inverters and would it be more of an, could you maybe put the inverter in a different place and run, you know, he's saying, he's thinking of using LEDs directly off of the panels with, without an inversion. Uh, that's, a, I'm sure it would be more efficient if you had LEDs that were, um, that were DC, if that's the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the inverter, the, the micro inverter is about 96% efficient okay. okay um so there's so some loss. there's certainly some loss there but but minimal yeah okay we've got a with the questions are rolling in now i don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if we want to let, let's let's uh so we've got some we've got uh let me see we've got a question I, about property taxes solar yeah Tesla. i'm looking i could quickly run through a few of these so the, yeah the the uh property tax there is a property tax exemption for residential installations 20 uh, 20 years that your your uh, uh, the value can be increased, but your taxable value cannot be increased by the system. So say it's a thirty thousand dollars system, um, your assessed value could go up by thirty thousand dollars, but you you can't be taxed on that additional thirty thousand. Um, that's in the state of Massachusetts. There's no sales tax on these either. Um, the let's see. The the Tesla roof tile question. Um, I you know I have my own opinions on Tesla roof. Um, I think building integrated is a very interesting topic in general when it comes to solar. I, th I think we're going to see a lot more of that coming down the road. Um, I don't think that um, the 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 solar roof has certainly knocked it out of the park yet. We are not going to be installing. Tesla roof anytime soon. Uh, I think traditional solar is certainly more cost effective. Uh, there's the argument that if you're going to be re-roofing anyway, is it more cost effective? That depends really on the roof itself. If you have a, a single story ranch um, with you know very simple roof, then it might uh, be similar cost to a rear roof and traditional panels. Uh, but overall, the effectiveness um, of of the traditional solar panels uh, that you see in the photos on this slide uh, are are much better than than Tesla. There's um, you know I really I do really like the the DC optimizers with the solar edge system um, and the microinverters from Enphase. Uh, we primarily are Enphase uh, shop, and and I I think there are huge benefits to microinverters. Um, that's something that can't be applied to a solar roof either. So uh, I'm excited to see, you know, as building integrated solar matures to what, you know, what the next thing will be. But um, for us, we're, you know, we're playing it safe for now and, and sticking with traditional solar. Okay, great. Uh, Just one more quick question and we'll, we'll stop for now. Um, it, on Cape Cod, are there common issues with damage from squirrels or other wildlife kind of yep. finding refuge in, yeah. you know, under the panels? So yeah, we have a, a service team and I think um, they could use some expletives to, uh, to describe squirrels. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's certainly an issue. Uh, the, the squirrels mostly, most, more than anything else, um, it seems like, you know, years ago, 2010 to 2015, it, it was rare. Um, there was 
one year, whether if it's coincidence or not, that there was a, an acorn explosion, and it seemed like after that, the next few years, there were a lot of uh, a lot more calls about about critters under panels. Um, we do install critter guard in a lot of systems. I don't have it on my house. I'm here full time, and I can easily see under the panels when I, I drive in the driveway, and I can look up, and I can make sure that there's nothing happening under there. Um, but if that's not the case, I would I'd say Critter Guard is a uh, inexpensive um, insurance policy to prevent or help at least help prevent uh, critters from creating a refuge underneath your solar array. Okay, great. We do have one more question, but I think we should. Um, I don't know if you want to continue with the. Uh, continue with the presentation here for a minute. We'll come back to Richard's question. Sure. Um, so yeah, benefits of, of residential solar, um, reduce or eliminate electric bills. And I think the second part of this is uh, one that obviously really has come to light recently um, with electric rates where they are uh, now, but a hedge against electric rates increasing over time. So most of the economic analysis, and we're gonna go through a, um, a sample residential uh, cost analysis, but we always use a fixed electric rate. We don't um, have a crystal ball of where electric rates are going to go. Uh, so we typically use a fixed rate over time, um, but we have, you know, we've seen a, a huge increase in electric rates uh, as of January this year. Um, clean energy for your home. That's an obvious one, and then uh, obviously the incentives, tax credits, and a short-term cost recovery uh, were somewhere in between six and six and eight years um, to see the full cost recovered from a system on, on a residential roof, whether it's um, whether it's ten panels or, or forty panels. There's obviously some economy scale on the larger end, but uh, that yeah, six to eight year payback uh, with a system that has. 25 year warranties on all the components, the, the racking, the panels and the inverters all carry 25 year warranties. Some components may be different, um, but standard for what we do is 25 years across the board. Um, so mentioning different size systems, this is an eight panel system on a little apron roof that you can barely see, but um, that is in Brewster. Um, this is, let's see, one, two, about a 30 panel system uh, in Truro. It's another one down near Breakwater Beach in Brewster. Uh, historic districts require, typically require an all black panel. This one, although not visible from anywhere, um, was in a historic district. Uh, this is the uh, system that faces east-west with a fairly low pitch. So uh, we covered both sides of the roof. And there's an, a very dark photo, but uh, 40, I believe it was 44 panels on that roof. Oh. And then ground mount uh, is always an option if, if your roof doesn't work. Um, or you have a great a good space somewhere in your yard or wherever else. Uh, this is a pressure treated ground mount system that we designed uh, this location, I believe in Dartmouth. Um, so the financial analysis, again, this is a not a quote. Um, it, it should give you an idea of what the incentives are um, and sort of how to look at uh, how to look at a quote or how to and, and, and what the incentives are to come back. So 24 panel system, here we used uh, 365 watt modules. Um, we are installing some up to you know, over 400, 405s. Uh, on the commercial side, we have, there's panels that are about 475 watts that we're about to install in the project. And if you look back to 2009, 2010, 2011 panel sizes, uh, this is DC, um, we're in the low, 200 watt so it's coming along um you know it's it's slow but but every year there's a few more watts uh, per panel 
So 24 panels, this system, again, 8,760 watts or 8.76 kilowatt system. Price for that system, about $31,000. The state tax credit, state tax credit currently is 15% of the cost of the system, but it's capped at a thousand. So every system that we've ever done that uh, gets that thousand dollar tax credit, assuming they're, it's their primary residence. The federal tax credit, doesn't matter if it's primary residence or not, it's 26% of the entire cost of the system. There's potential that um, that could could change. Uh, it's definitely, certainly it's set to step down uh, next year, or it could be increased with the climate portion of the Build Back Better. But um, I don't know if anybody's holding their breath for uh, DC to do anything <laughs> at this point. Um, so you have your thousand dollar state tax credit, your almost eight thousand dollar federal tax credit. So after getting your tax credits back in year one. You're, you've saved about or received back about nine thousand on the system cost. Um, using uh, again, going back to the the um, shading analysis, pitch orientation shading, we assumed this system was in a good location, about a ninety percent overall effectiveness. That's where we came up with our production of kilowatt hours per year. So this eight point seven six kilowatt system when we take into consideration the historical data for our region um, at that 90% is about 10,000 kilowatt hours per year, 10,578 to be precise. So what does that mean um, in terms of, again, that, that revenue grade meter that we saw or the, the solar production meter that was monitoring the SMART incentive currently? Uh, we're coming into block seven of the SMART program. That's a 4.3 cent um, incentive per kilowatt hour produced. So that 4.3 cents multiplied by the total production of the system uh, gives us about $456 a year for this system um, in, in incentive payment that would be coming in on a monthly basis for the SMART program. And again, that's just not doesn't matter if you use it in the house or not it's the solar production it's creating renewable energy certificates uh, and then you're getting the utilities buying those from you to fulfill an obligation that was set on them by the state the estimated annual electric savings so there um, we're using 27 and a half cents per kilowatt hour most recent bill i saw was around 30 cents per kilowatt hour um, but we assume that it will go down in the summertime and so on average around 27 and a half cents this year per kilowatt hour. Uh, so the savings about $2,900 on your electric bill. So those two combined together about $3,300 a year, divide that into your after tax incentive price, we get about a six and a half year payback on a system. So again, this is a system that's got a, a pretty good exposure. Um, uh, and we, we're seeing about a six and a half year payback. The um, benefit at year 20. So this is after we recouped your 31,000 that you put out, the remaining um, three and a half years of SMART, and then another 10 years of just the electrical savings brings us up to $40,000 ahead of the game. Uh, if you didn't do solar and you just paid out of pocket, um, it's about, you're paying about $58,000 in that same time period in, in 20 years. And then just to compare a little bit larger system, all the same numbers, uh, but you'll see it, everything is pretty much scaled up to a larger system. The only thing that stays stagnant is that st state tax rate at a thousand. Otherwise, um, everything's scalable to the size project. A little bit lower, uh, a quicker return because economy of scale, the, the cost per watt is slightly lower on a larger system. Let's see, any other questions here? Yeah, we have some more questions. Um, let me Can I ask up. a question just on the math? Um, so take that 24 panel 
are are you saying with the last two lines that basically the the overall savings out of your pocket would be ninety eight thousand or is it eighteen thousand? So the yeah, so the, the the estimated net benefit at year twenty uh, that means after you've recouped that thirty one thousand that you initially put up to purchase the system in six and a half years. And then after, from six and a half years to year 20, you've benefited another 40,000. So it's 81,000 really from the day the system was installed. The, the 58,000 is assuming we never did solar, how much you would be paying. That's that your electric savings here. So the estimated annual electric savings uh, of 2,900 that's multiplied by 20 years. Okay. So that's where that, those numbers came from, yep. But, but the net should be adding both of those together, right? Sorry. I said the net would be adding both of those together because the net benefit at year 20 is your saving versus the cost of doing. So I, I think the initial question that was asked, it does seem like it's a $98,000 benefit. I'm saving- That is, that is my question. Yeah, I'm saving 40 rather than spending 58. Um, yeah, you're, so you're, you have spent the 38, yeah, I guess you could look at it that way. Because you've uh, included, yeah, you've included that spend up above, I think. So, you, so you've got ninety eight thousand dollars more in your bank account at the end of the twenty years than you would have if you've never had never done solar. Right. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yep. So you're yeah ahead of the game forty thousand, or you're out of pocket fifty eight. Right. The the delta of of ninety eight. Um, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, couple other questions here. I'm just, uh, question from Rich. Do you see your solar usage driving the use of smart home electrical tools to manage overall electrical usage? Um, I like to just add on the mobile app that you talked about with the real time monitoring. That's super cool. I, I wasn't even aware that that was possible. Um, but are there, do you see other tools? Like uh, I've seen one called TED, the electrical detective. You can hook it to your panel. It tells you what it's using. Like what, what's happening in that space? Do you see that? Yeah. We, we did uh, install some TED units. Um, they take up a lot of space in the panel, uh, but we do have consumption monitoring. So it, you can, uh, battery storage, um, and we'll get into that a little bit, uh, but, you can you can monitor your usage from the battery. You can monitor your usage from the utility grid, and you can monitor all this you know all of your circuits. If you wanted to put CTs on on every circuit, you could monitor exactly what you're using you know in, in every circuit throughout the house. Um, we are doing a lot of just overall household uh, consumption monitoring, so it'll be just a CT on the main to show you know what you're using, when you're using it, when it's going back to the utility grid. Um, I think, yeah, we, we talk about all the time of, of decreasing uh, electric usage, changing to smart or changing to, to LED lights, um, uh, energy efficient uh, appliances within the home, but then we're also adding more components that are electric. Um, like I said, yeah, there's, um, my my father's got an electric chainsaw, you know. So changing battery, changing to battery powered tools uh, instead of gas powered items. Um, so I think we're going to see you know demand for electricity go up as we try to decrease uh, or increase the efficiency of of all those other items too. Um, but I'm not. Hopefully that answered the the question a little bit. Um, there are a lot of monitoring devices for uh, individual home loads. Um, and when it comes to battery storage, you're able to turn things on and off, see what 
what's using, uh, you know, how much power you're using in, with certain devices so that you can monitor your battery um, health during a power outage. Okay, great. Uh, Bert Jackson has a question. Um, what kind of increase in capacity do you think is needed if you add an electric vehicle charging to the mix? How quickly yeah. is the panel technology advancing? The, I guess that would mean uh, solar panel versus electrical panel, because this question was asked a few minutes ago. Yeah, the, the um, electric car question is an interesting one. It, that really comes down to personal habits, how much you're driving the car, where you're going. Um, so it, it could be different for every person. Um, typically, you know, if, yeah, it's really hard to say. Um, if you're using your car daily to drive off Cape and back, it may be up, upwards of 12 to 15 more solar panels to cover that electric usage. Um, if it's just around town, then it, it's, it goes, uh, goes down from there. But that is, um, yeah, that's a, a difficult question to answer specifically without knowing individual. I understand. Habits. You use more electricity, you need more panels. Engineers yeah. will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and you can always um, add on these systems. That's what's nice about it. We've done multiple add-ons. Um, so things are, you can add on um, anytime as electric usage goes up. I have extra roof space on my house. So when I get my, I have a deposit for an electric car. When I get that, um, I'll probably be adding more panels to my roof. It's okay. I, I don't expect you to know specific decim three point decimal places how many kilowatt hours, but I think I think that was a that was a good a thoughtful response. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brian has an interesting question. How does the cost to install or maintain a ground mount system compared to a roof uh, differ? Is it easier, obviously, on the ground, yeah. or is it more money, less yeah. money? It's more money. It's a uh, it's a bit more um, labor intensive and uh, material intensive installation than it would be on the roof. Um, we're either uh, drilling, we're, we're either pouring concrete um, footings or bringing in um, ballasted concrete footings. Then you're, you're building a structure to put the panels on. So with a roof mount, you already have the structure. We just go up there, we put the rails on, the panels go on the roof with the ground mount. Uh, you have to build the structure to put the panels on. Maintenance, certainly, uh, there, there isn't a lot of maintenance overall, um, but there was the question about critters. You know, if it's like on a ground mount system, you're able to you know, take a look, get behind there. If there's an inverter goes out, if a panel were to go out over time, very easy, obviously, to, to replace them. Um, but you see that, that fixed payback period of six and a half years, it'll probably jump um you know a year and a half or so for a ground mounted system um so it's just some additional cost up front but there is an ease of maintenance um to ground mounted we probably do 90 percent roof mount uh, with residential customers okay great thank you no more questions at this point we're at the five four minute mark here so i don't know how much we'll be able to what you want to cover in the last few minutes here yeah i think um i'll just pop forward to commercial so this is the building the 100 independence building um wow. that uh, we have 862 panels on the roof um so quickly for commercial solar uh high return on investment additional benefits to what we saw in the last slide would be depreciation um is in obviously the residential residential tax credit goes away, but but on the commercial side you can depreciate a system, um, and you also have the economy of scale when you get to these larger systems to drive that cost per watt down. Um, for businesses, reducing stabilizing operating costs. Uh, a lot of customers that on, on the commercial side are asking for a little kiosk to to show what their production is in the in the lobby. Um, so it's a way to you know, lead, lead the way in local sustainable business practices and market your business um, to your customers and to your employees. Uh, you're committed to the environmental issues. Um, 
additional source of revenue to you or your business. So owning the system, there's obviously the benefits there. Uh, in the scenario like this is actually um, the owner of the, the building is getting a payment for the roof space. So instead of buying the system outright, he just said, you know, I'll take a, a lease payment, a long-term lease. And so he's getting revenue from the roof uh, through the lease. The owner of the system is getting revenue um, through the, the sale of electricity. A lot of different ways to participate in commercial solar. Um, and again, probably too many to go over, um, but uh, so whether you're a, a small business, large business, nonprofit, um, you can own the system and make money, or you could potentially look into a roof lease or even a ground lease uh, option. We personally don't do leasing on the residential side. Um, on the commercial side, we will uh, lease roof space. So the top left, this is a uh, outright ownership system in Mashpee, um, smaller commercial system in East Ham on the bottom left. Uh, top right is a power purchase agreement with a nonprofit in Orleans. They buy the, the power that's coming off of the roof. Um, and there's the press hall in Wellfleet. Uh, a nonprofit that um, opted to own the system outright. So are we doing, we've got uh, two minutes couple left. A couple minutes left and one, 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 one remaining question. So Andrew, it's Bert. I, I've got a quick question. You know, I'm, I'm involved with uh, Pres Hall and we've, we had a real challenge uh, with historical you know, going and getting these panels here. What have you seen, you know, in in terms of historic districts uh, resisting uh, solar panels? Yeah, it's that's a good question. Um, we actually are going to be on a call with the um, Sierra Club of Cape Cod on Tuesday night discussing that exact topic. Um, every Every town is different and every board is different. And when, um, even when the board changes hands, you know, from from one group within the same town to the next, their interpretation of the old Kings Highway Bolton is different. Um, so there's, it, it doesn't have clear, um, it doesn't have clear distinction of what should be or what can be approved. And so that's something that we're working on. Um, I've offered my. Uh, my time to the Julian Sears office um, to help with that, but it's uh, it's kind of a flip a coin when we go in for um, historic approvals. Um, we you know uh, we worked with Town of Chatham, their HBDC uh, to uh, at least have some guidelines. So an all black panel, a racking system that's black that ends with the ends of the panels. Um, uh, you know, a design that that is attractive and trying to eliminate exterior conduit. You know, some of those things that that can be done uh, might take a little bit more time. But um, in some cases, we still see that if you can see the corner of a panel in a historic district, the board um, the board does not allow the project to go forward. Um, it's an interesting interesting stance, I think, but. Uh, I think that there can be there can be a happy medium there um, where a win-win where we can create standards um, for solar approval. And so people if, if we even heard from some committees saying that they think it might be illegal for them to approve solar uh, in the historic district, which is again, it's all based on interpretation. Um, one board could interpret the Bolton completely different than another. So it's uh, it can be frustrating. I guess that's the short answer to your question. All right. Well, we we are at our time. Um, we do have one question. It's a true or false. Uh, George heard there's a limit of ten kilowatt hours. I don't know ten w ten kwh to the size of a residential solar system. Is that true or false? Um. Depends on where you depends on where you live in the territory you're in. Eastern Massachusetts Eversource Territory, 
which covers all of Cape Cod um, and most of uh, the South Shore and, uh, and the South Coast, the, we can install a system over 10 kilowatts. 10 kilowatt threshold for single phase, which is most residential customers, um, is that uh, I meant I kind of quickly touched on earlier. Um, once you go over 10 kilowatts, and it's 10 kilowatts AC, not 10 kilowatts DC. Um, so you could have a 13 kilowatt DC system with 10 kilowatts AC um, inverters behind them. So 10 kilowatts AC, as soon as you go over that threshold, uh, you need to get approval from the Massachusetts uh, applications for cap allocation. And when you do that, you can still interconnect to the utility grid. The utility decreases your net metering rate from 100% of retail to 60% of retail. So anything that you send back to the utility that you would use in a, in a different billing um, cycle, anything that goes from one month to the next, that would be that would be uh, uh, held at a discounted rate from full from re, full retail value. If you um, had a huge electric usage and you never were going to have um, a credit rolling forward on your bill, you could install a larger system without an issue never have that decreased net metering value on your bill. So the, the answer is is kind of. Um, in <laughs> in uh, national grid territory, they have met their net metering caps. So we really can't go above 10 kilowatts um, unless you wanted to do a standalone system, which would be bringing in a new meter onto your property strictly for that project. Uh, it's That gets a little more complicated. Um, so there are limitations to the 10 kilowatts. A lot of times we stay, you know, we try to stay at the 10 kilowatts if there's going to be net metering credits, um, but we certainly have gone over that in, in many occasions where it, it makes sense. All right, great, thank you. I, I gotta say, I'm very impressed. You're handling, there's some pretty obscure questions here and you're just like, you're just belting, belting out the answers. I'm very impressed. Um, we're a couple minutes over. Why don't we, we should zip through the battery storage and we'll, any other questions, we'll get over to you in email. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna, last slide has my email address on it. So if anybody needs that, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, so battery is an interesting topic. It's been very kind of a hot button recently. Um, obviously, I think the, the, the first bullet point here is, is really the main one for us, uh, which is protection during power outages. Um, that's mainly what batteries are being used for right now. Um, greater independence from uh, growing grid instability, blackouts, brownouts, everything else is instantaneous um, uh, power backup. Reduce our reliance on the dirtiest energy sources. Uh, so, you know, high demand times when um, the utility turns on those oil burning power plants. Um, instead of those turning on, we can convert over to battery storage if you're giving the utility access to your batteries uh, or if they're building their own battery systems uh, that they can rely on those first, the, the dirtiest of the power plants. Um, protection, protect against future time of use billing. We don't have time of use billing in Massachusetts yet. Um, that will be another uh boost to the 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 um, battery industry um it's happening in california but we don't have that here yet uh, so really it's just for for backup power uh, net zero lifestyle just knowing that you're storing your own solar electricity in the, the you mentioned that the tax credit is only available for batteries as it, as it is now if they're connected to solar so the net zero lifestyle is that you're storing your solar energy in your batteries instead of it going back to the utility grid you're keeping all that there you're really um you know, you're really net zero and you're uh, and you're being as green as as possible by eliminating the use of the electric grid i'll just quickly pop through these I think the most important one here again is the top. We've heard people say that the, uh, the one battery, one power wall can run your house for seven days. The kind of going back to that question about um, how many panels you need for your car, it, everything is based on individual usage, individual needs, what's running in your house, what you want to run when the power goes out, how many people are living in the house. That you know that that all comes down to that. So it, it's it's a um, much more intensive. Uh, discussion and um, 
and a set really a site assessment you have to go look at your service panel see what size breakers are um, to be able to determine how many batteries you need um, and, and to be able to meet what your requirements are what your needs and wants are for for battery backup um, decreases the carbon footprint is a pro uh, instantaneous backup power and the monitoring capability which quickly touched on earlier as well as the pro um, as i mentioned it's very complex in figuring out um, what battery system you need to meet your needs meet your personal habits batteries are very expensive and limited incentives um, and additional infrastructure and space requirements uh, the the from a permitting perspective if you are over a certain size battery um, well even a small battery still needs space in the house if you're over 20 kilowatts you need fire proofing if you're over 40 kilowatts we need sprinkler systems and so it it can become a, a bigger project um, adding to the cost um, so it's you it, it, it hear a lot of everybody's interested in battery storage uh, it's not as simple as plugging in a battery and letting your house you know run off the grid um, there's a lot that goes into it and and so that's kind of what i wanted to express here is it works um, but it's not quite as easy as it might sound um, We do it a little, a little over time here, but um, okay. yeah, I, we are we're certainly not the only solar company on the on the Cape. Um, I do feel pretty strongly about uh, keeping energy dollars local. If you're if you're using a local company, um, yeah, one your the the energy the dollars are going to that local company to to help um, uh, keep people here on the Cape uh, employed, with good jobs. Um, also, your energy dollars are no longer going in an envelope over the bridge to a large utility company. They're staying in your pocket to you know, help you pay back the loan that maybe you took to put solar on your roof. And then when it's paid off, those energy dollars are staying in your pocket, which you can then use within the community. So I think there's a, a, a multiple benefits to um, keeping energy dollars local. Um, customization, just being able to, to meet at the house, I, I think, uh, site on-site assess on-site site assessments um, are critical to making sure that you get it right um, the first time and meeting your needs um, more than just a transaction it's not it's not a the the installation of solar is typically two days um, but the relationship to make sure that all the incentives, everything's happening, the utility is, is treating your bill correctly, giving the credit that you deserve on your bill, uh, that's an ongoing relationship. So somebody that's there to support that. Um, and then uh, obviously community investment and involvement with local companies. So again, that's not just for us, that's, uh, there's plenty of, of good local companies around. Mm -hmm.